Hey, my friend, is eating more beans the key to a longer life? What about olive oil? Does it help you live longer or does it actually shorten your life? What about animal food or animal meat, good or bad? Check out this interview with Dr. Joel Furman, who explains why the nutritarian diet may be the answer to great health and longevity. If you're enjoying some of this content and the interviews, please make sure to subscribe down below so you can get notified the next time we release our next video so you can get some of the amazing health and anti-aging advice for free. Stay tuned for an amazing discussion. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Anti-Aging Hacks podcast. Today, I have a very special guest. His name is Dr. Joel Furman, and Dr. Furman is a board-certified family physician, seven-time New York Times bestselling author, and internationally recognized expert on nutrition and natural healing, who specializes in preventing and reversing disease through nutritional methods. Dr. Furman coined the term nutritarian to describe his longevity-promoting, nutrient-dense, plant-rich eating style. For over 25 years, Dr. Furman has shown that it is possible to achieve sustainable weight loss and reverse heart disease, diabetes, and many other illnesses using smart nutrition. In his medical practice and through his books and PBS television specials, he continues to bring this life-saving message to hundreds of thousands of people around the world. With that said, Dr. Froman, welcome to the Anti-Aging Hacks Show. Thank you. Great to be here. Looking forward to our discussion. Fantastic. I've been following your work for a few years. You have seven New York Times bestsellers under your, under your belt. And you have the, certainly have the authority to talk about losing weight, reversing disease, and strengthening the immune system. So as a means of getting started, please tell the audience about yourself and why you decided to write seven books. I've written 13 books. Oh, wow. But, but seven of them became New York Times bestsellers. Some of my best books have not become New York Times bestsellers. Huh. Because, the, you know, it's what a best-selling book doesn't mean it's your best book. It just means what people buy the most of, you know what I mean? Right. Like one of my best books is... Um, Fast Food Genocide, a fascinating book, but did not become a New York Times bestseller. You know, another book that's a really great book of mine called um, Disease Proof Your Child is not a New York Times bestseller, just for interest, people's interest. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, I, you know, when I was young, I was, a, I was a figure skater. I was third in the world, actually, in pairs figure skating with my sister. And I was interested in health and nutrition. My father was kind of overweight and sickly. And I got into, he got into reading nutrition books with me and he got, you know, lost weight and got healthier. And, and I eventually went to medical school with a specific intent to be a physician specializing in nutrition so I can get people totally well and not keep them on drugs the rest of their life. So I went to medical school with the desire to do what I'm doing right now. And I've had, you know, obviously more than 30 years of having an exciting career of really, what makes it so exciting is that the magical transformation of having people get well and you being a part of that and being part of their life as they achieve that. You know, for example, a woman with psoriatic arthritis with terrible rashes on drugs that were keeping her sick for 20, 30 years in bed, couldn't move her joints, making a complete recovery off all medications, no psoriasis. Wow. People with, you know, not, not only people with advanced heart disease and getting well from diabetes, but even people with kidney insufficiency due to diabetic nephropathy getting well and people with diabetic retinopathy getting well, having their eyes come back to normal again. And wow. so it's really um, watching what excellent nutrition can do, whether it's getting well from rheumatoid arthritis, ulcerative colitis, lupus. I have many people who've made complete recoveries from lupus using nutritional methods. So, and even, and so I, and even certain people with certain people with um, early stage cancers actually reversing it. So what I'm saying is this idea so the word nutritarian is designed to be the gold standard of uh, dietary approaches to give people maximum ability to get well and to, of course, slow the aging process. But what I'm saying right now is that it sounds kind of ridiculous to make this false claim that we can age backwards or anti-age. But I have to say that I'm seeing this all the time mm -hmm. and I can measure it and prove it. Because like, for example, a person comes into my retreat here in San Diego and we do a, t a swab to check their telomere length and their telomeres shows that their chronological age, that their biological age is 10 years older than their chronological age. So they're, they're testing out as a 60 year old, but they're really only 50 years old, right? right? Now they stay here for three months, they lose 50 pounds of body weight, 
they're flooded with high nutrient eating and they're getting super healthier. And we rechecked their telomeres and now they are 10 years below their chronological age and now they tested a 40 year old. So I'm not saying we took 20 years off the life because maybe the test is not that accurate, but we got them in such better health that the numbers, the inflammatory markers, the CRP, the insulin resistance, the, uh, the hormonal levels, as well as the markers of biological aging, aging showed a marked imp- um, benefit just in the three month period. It's, it's utterly amazing. So, and I could show you one case in one picture after another, you could just look at them and see that they look so much younger after they dropped um, their 75 pounds and are starting and eating so healthily. So yes, I'm suggesting that we have an unprecedented opportunity in human history to live longer and healthier than ever before if we take advantage of modern nutritional science and the, and the lifespan of humans in the modern world should be able to be in the 95 to 105 range for most people in that bell-shaped curve between 95 and 105, whereas now it bells around between 60 and 90. It's a wide bell, and you don't know if you're going to die at 60 or live to be 90, but it's a, such a wide curve, anything could happen to you. That's fantastic, and there's so many questions I have. You just opened the Pandora's box there, but uh, I will uh, ask them in order. But first of all, I think, Dr. Furman, the, the most important question I guess I have for you and for the listeners is that we're seeing such a wide variety of diseases that are afflicting the modern world, modern societies in particular, but also now being exported to the third world. Well, in your opinion, what's causing this high rate of disease in, in this world? Well, don't forget, most people in the modern world are dying of three things, heart attacks, strokes, and cancers. Mm-hmm. That still overwhelms everything, including COVID or infection. It's still the overwhelming cause of death. Even COVID is a blip in the historical decade, you know what I mean? Right. So it's still, but even COVID is linked to higher susceptibility. Not that you're not going to get a little sick and get a mildly illness, but the severity of the illness you get and whether it can kill you is totally dependent on your personal health, mm-hmm. which is now, and your immune function, which is totally dependent on your nutrition and your lifestyle. So you have, the, so we are essentially already resistant from COVID hospitalization and COVID death when, we're, when we keep ourselves in excellent health with superior nutrition. We're resistant to those damages. But I'm saying also that nobody has to have a heart attack or a stroke, and we can wipe out more than 90% of cancers, that all these diseases that afflict us and cut short our life prematurely are preventable and related to environmental and lifestyle. Even people with a genetic propensity for a disease, like the GSTP1 gene for breast cancer, or the BRCA gene for breast cancer, those abnormal gene defects are suppressed and unable to cause a problem in a high, with a diet with a high intake of green cruciferous vegetables and scallions and onions. The, the NRF2 transcription proteins and there's other mechanisms via which cells can allow, um, can repair damage and allow damaged areas to still express um, genetic effects. So what I'm saying right now is that people, that nutrition overwhelms genetics when and nutritional excellence overwhelms genetics and not that the genetics doesn't play a role and not that microbes don't play a role i mean there are parasites there are there's dangerous bacteria there's worm diseases there's tuberculosis there's malaria there's all kinds of things that that can affect healthy people but most but they're on they're how you can say they are mostly rare in the modern world in our clean environment where we have running water and flushing toilets and we're not living in the jungle, most of us can avoid serious infections. And the viral infections that we're exposed to wouldn't be much of a risk if we're keeping our cell immune system in excellent health. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And you touched on two factors that are quite popular in the biohacking world that I'm part of. One is lifestyle, of course, and the second one is nutrition, where you put in your body. And so a combination of these definitely affect the epigenetics that we have. And I've also heard People say that your genetics are not your destiny, meaning your body or your how long you live might be only 20% influenced by your genetics and as much as 80% influenced by your epigenetics, which we can control uh, as we're going to talk about. So in terms of the epigenetic control over our bodies and nutrition in particular, Dr. Furman, uh, what is the nutritarian diet? How did you come up with it? And what is the overall concept? How do you bucket things or principles of the nutritarian diet? Right. You know, there's, they, we came up with it because... The, the concept that you have to eat healthy to be healthy can't be denied. And, and people, as ridiculous and silly as this sounds, people want to argue that a diet less healthy is healthier than one that's more healthy. Isn't that a stupid thing? Obviously, a diet that's more nutrient-rich and nutrient-diverse 
and giving you more nutritional values of everything humans need in the, the full symphonic spectrum is going to be healthy when it's missing nutrients or not giving you levels that are optimized. So clearly what I'm saying right now is a diet that nutritional excellence um, pays dividends with health protection and lifespan. Number two is the, when you eat unhealthy foods that don't contain nutrients in them, like processed foods, like bagels and cookies and, and crackers and rice cakes and breakfast bars and chips and cold cereals and soft drinks and fried foods, and you eat junk food, you may not feel sick right then and there, but the bill comes due 40 years later. You don't get that for nothing. You're paying a price with diminished lifespan and increased risk of disease, and you're allowing diseases to be expressed. Everybody who eats the conventional American diet is shortening their lifespan by decades. And they should know that that's happening just because they don't feel it. It's like you smoke a cigarette now, you're not gonna feel ill for 20, 40 years, but eventually you're gonna pay a price for that. You're not gonna get it for free. The bill eventually comes due. I know. You know, you, when you lose brain cells, when you drink alcohol and get drunk, and when you take drugs, you lose brain cells. And when you have excursions of glucose from eating sugar and of course, honey, maple syrup, but white flour is the same as sugar and honey and maple syrup. White flour converts into sugar in the bloodstream and you spike the glucose in the bloodstream and chronically the high intake of these high glycemic carbohydrates also just can weaken and lead to dementia and destroy brain cells and increase propensity for cancer, heart disease, and stroke. So people are doing, and, they, and, people, and it's, it becomes the staple of the American diet. I call the American diet the cake diet because people don't realize that Italian bread is cake. You know, hamburger buns are cake. Pizza is cake. There's no biological difference between white flour and sugar. If you've got a pancake in the morning or a cold cereal, a piece of white bread or a croissant or a bagel, that's cake. It's sugar and flour. And, it's gonna de and you're destroying your health with every single bite. And then you move on to lunch and you have a pizza or a burger or a pasta with white flour. It's cake. And then you, you know, they have a muffin, which is a cake without the icing. Or then they have a pizza, you know, whatever they're doing, they're just shoving garbage in their mouth. And by the way, animal products like um, chicken and meat and, you know, whatever, egg, turkey, they do not contain phytochemicals and antioxidants that extend human lifespan. So I'm saying a piece of chicken is like a bagel. They're both contain macronutrients, calories, but don't contain the micronutrients that slow aging and can suppress genetic alterations that can lead to disease. Now, the foundational principle, a Nutritarian diet has four foundational, four principles. The first and most important one are these six words that people have to write down and memorize. The first three words are moderate caloric restriction. You have, if you're overweight, you're not healthy. There's no such thing as an overweight, healthy person. Fat on the body is an inflammatory promoting tissue. It's abnormal tissue. It's demonstrative of a poor diet in every case, fat on the body or raw. And, and so fat cells spew out lycokines and cytokines. They attract nutrients, making, they sequester nutrients. So they take nutrients away from the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. They make you insulin resistant. They, they, they activate aromatase, producing higher levels of estrogen. They promote angiogenesis, allowing cancer cells to replicate. Fat on the body is extremely dangerous. We have to be lean. And so there's no, so moderate caloric restriction to achieve a, a body fat below, let's say 15, 14% for a male and below 25% for a female is absolutely essential. You know, so the whole American population is overweight, by the way. Yeah. The American, the, the American, the, um, National Institute of Health claims 70% of people are overweight or obese, which is totally wrong because they use a BMI line of 23, above 23 is the demarcation line for overweight people. And there's no long lived people's BMI of 23. That's, you know, that's already being overweight. Right. You, you, all long lived people are below BMI is below 21, below 22 for a male and below 21 for a female. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. The government uses 25 as the demarcation line. 25 BMI, which is okay. all. And so I'm saying, even if we use 23 as the demarcation line, which even is an ideal, then we still get 89% of Americans that are overweight, not 70%. You right. follow me? And the 11% yeah. that are not overweight, only 2.4% of those people are doing it with eating and healthfully and exercising regularly. The other, you know, 9% are people who are just sick, who are smoke cigarettes or are alcoholics or who are sickly or who have autoimmune conditions or who are depressed or who are, have occult cancers or are elderly people, you know, or have um, muscle, muscle and bone wasting due to, in other words, most of the majority of people in the normal weight category are sick people. Because if they were sick, healthy, they'd be overweight eating American food. Mm -hmm. So the first principle of a nutritarian diet is moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence. Mm -hmm. 
That's those five words, moderate caloric restriction in the context of, or the, in a micronutrient excellence, having a full level of nutritional adequacy of all nutrients humans need with a, with a high enough concentration of antioxidants and phytochemicals for the body's immune system to be fully, fully protective. The second principle of nutritarian diet is that your diet has to be hormonally favorable. Mm-hmm. If you eat too much animal products, you drive up IGF-1, which accelerates the aging process, yep. makes you age much faster. And if, you, and if you eat too much glycemic carbohydrates, you drive up insulin, which, is, which promotes cancer and ages you faster. So both animal products and refined carbohydrates push up and make you age faster. So it has to be hormonally favorable. And number three, we can't expose ourselves to poisons, toxins, and chemical substances. Even, even being in California during the fi- and living around the fires, inhaling smoke, is lifespan shortening and can even increase the risk of dementia or cancer. Matter of fact, cancers started in the 17th century, wasn't much too much recorded cancers. The first cancers that were very prevalent were people who worked as, were men who worked as chimney sweeps, inhaling smoke. Hmm. And smoke inhalers, people who were inhaling smoke had a higher risk of scrotal cancer and testicular cancer. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, um, so it's to- a toxic environment, avoiding chemicals. And of course, we're chemicalizing the world. We have no, um, fear of pollution and chemicals and causing climate change and fires and burning things. And people put, they put fires in their house. They put, they burn um, fireplaces and they burn wood and smoke comes in their house. It's right. the craziest thing in the world that they'd increase the risk of cancer to look at a fireplace. You know what I mean? So, so mm-hmm. that's an important one. We've got to avoid things that are poisonous. It's, a, it's almost stupid to be simple. You know, mm-hmm. don't expose yourself to poisonous bacteria, you know, um, chemical substances, you know, pathogenic worms and, and, you know, and, other type of disease agents. And of course, the last principle of a nutritarian diet is comprehensive nutritional adequacy, making sure you're not missing any particular nutrient that humans need, because you could be eating all the kale and strawberries and flax seeds and all these healthy foods, but if you're deficient in vitamin D or deficient in DHA or deficient in zinc or deficient in B12, you could be, lo- you could be in trouble because of the one thing you're missing. And we need, need a comprehensive exposure to thousands of nutrients to reach optimal health. And only in the modern world do we have this unprecedented opportunity to be able to have such a huge variety of different foods, food colors, food types, and nutrients to maximize human immune function and immune possibility. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. I got the three principles. Let me repeat them to you. So four? Four principles. Okay. So number one was eating micronutrient-rich foods. Number two was eating enough of them or not... Um, over-indexing on one at the expense of the other nutrients that you need. So getting all of the nutrients, that's two. Number three, right? And uh, number three, I believe, was eating hormonally balancing foods, not raising IGF-1 or insulin in the wrong way, which we know do not promote a longer life. Correct. That's three. And uh, was there one more? Four was not poisoning yourself with things that are toxins. Okay. Yeah, not poisoning. Yeah, that's, uh, got it. Okay, perfect. So then... Uh, so the obvious question I think that listeners would have to this one is, okay, we understand the principle makes complete sense. What are the, uh, I guess, nutrient replete, micronutrient replete foods that we should be eating or a combination thereof that give us all that we need? And of course, they should read your book, Eat to Live. Uh, but if you could simplify those and eat categories of foods. Eat for mm-hmm. Life is a more recent book written in 2020 because Eat for Life was written in 20, 2004. Okay. So it was revised. It's always better to get the more modern, with all the modern references and things, sign up. Absolutely. References. So I'd, I would recommend more it would be Eat for Life than Eat to Live even. Okay. So in terms of uh, the principles you've outlined in Eat for Life, uh, what are some of the foods that complete the nutritional, the micronutrients that you need in your bodies? Well, I have this acronym called mm-hmm. G-BOMBS, mm-hmm. G B O M B S. Okay. And that's not all we eat is G bombs, but I, but it's there. So people recognize that I want them to eat these foods every day or regularly, you know, almost every day. Mm-hmm. And they, and the G bombs, what is that? Six foods, G B O M B S six foods mm-hmm. that just have the most scientific documentation to have anti-cancer and longevity promoting effects and heart disease promoting effects too. And though, so let's list those foods. G stands for the green vegetables, particularly green cruciferous vegetables like arugula, kale, broccoli, you know, bok choy, which is my favorite. And, um, and by the way, bok choy is my favorite because I grow it 
and it has no bugs. It looks beautiful, by the way. You can yeah. steam it, you can saute it, you can wok it, you can eat it raw in salads, you can make juice out of it, you can make, it's so versatile, yeah. but it's not, they don't get a lot of insects on it. You don't get like aphids and slugs and it's so easy to grow. It's just saying, wow, this is so easy to grow. It's like, mm. looks so beautiful. Anyway, so I'm a bok choy fan. Mm -hmm. The um, So green cruciferous, green vegetables is number one. Then you have B for beans and legumes like lentils and chickpeas and, and soybeans and, and beans. So G, B, O, onions and onions is the O and includes scallions and leeks, but scallions are an incredible longevity promoting food. Put some scallions, not only on your salad, but cut up some raw scallions. They're called, some people call them green onions. They're the onions that don't have the big bulb, you know, they yeah. eat the whole stem. So you cut it up, the green onion, and you put it on your cooked vegetables, raw, to make mm -hmm. the top of your green. You have a bowl of um, vegetable and bean soup, and you put the, sprinkle some green, raw green onion or raw scallion right on top of the soup and eat it with your soup. It's delicious, and it's really super lifespan enhancing. Mm -hmm. And so we went through GBO um, onions, mushrooms, and we should be eating more than one variety of mushrooms, even in a day. I, I recommend people use shiitake mushrooms cut up in soups and stews and woks, but then add a different type of mushroom in with the shiitakes. Shiitakes give it a great mouthfeel and chewiness, but maybe put some lion's mane or trumpet or, 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 or pearl mushroom or a oyster mushroom or a, some other mushroom mixed in. Even if, And it's not that expensive, even if you're buying it and it's $10 a pound, you're not eating that much of it anyway. You know what I mean? So $2 worth is tons, you know, but and any for the whole meal for, the whole, for four people. But anyway, so the so mu so mushrooms, onions, berries, which refer to the low sugar fruits that include kumquats and loquats and and you know and other passion fruit and and berry and blackberry and blueberry and wild berries and all kinds of, and you can get frozen berries and you know where could people in human history get frozen wild blueberries all year round out of their yeah. freezer? Right. You know, I know it costs people think it costs like six dollars a box of this little bit of berries that go bad and go rotten in your refrigerator a day later, but you can buy frozen and take out what you need and they're one third the price mm -hmm. and, and blackberries and blueberries and. And then last seeds like flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, you know, pumpkin seeds are super powerful anti-cancer effects. So we could throw a dart at any of these foods and discuss all the studies showing these incredible beneficial effects of every food having even studies on one food like flax seeds, like the ligands and flax seeds, just looking at that one intervention has shown a 71% reduction in breast cancer deaths of women, 10 women filed for 10 years who had breast cancer, that women in the top um, quartile of flax of um, lignin consumption had such a low risk of death in people eating no lignans, for example. Or, or a study on mushrooms showing women who had mushrooms daily had a 64 lower risk of breast cancer death. So we're, we're saying each individual food by itself shows tremendous degree of protection. When you put together a dietary portfolio that includes all these foods together, then the magic happens in the body's ability to actually reverse disease that you actually have there and, and maybe even age backwards. There we as go. As ridiculous as that sounds. Yeah, this is really cool. And it's, I think, fairly easy. Once you remember the acronym G-BOMBS, people can, when they're at the grocery store, start to buy more foods in these categories. And therefore, what you're saying, Dr. Froman, is that they'll be nutritionally complete micronutrients, uh, across spread across these foods will be enough for your body to be a complete uh, nutrient food that you can eat day in and day no. out. No, that's not yeah. correct. Okay. What else would you add to this? Because um, if you're eating those foods, those are not all the foods you're eating and, and anyway, but mm -hmm. um, would also when you move, it's true that the modern nutritional studies has shown that as you increase the animal protein, your diet, eggs, fish, things like that, you mm -hmm. shorten lifespan. And that's been reproduced in multiple studies. But we also know that as you increase plant protein in the diet, beans, greens, nuts, you actually enhance lifespan, that we want to reduce animal protein and increase plant protein foods. So as we move our diet to increase longevity from an animal product diet that's supplying us with zinc and B12 and other beneficial nutrients, iron, and we're on a plant-based diet, which doesn't have the levels of zinc and B12 and K2 and iron, there's certain nutrients we're not getting in optimal amounts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So not only are G-bombs not the full nutritional diversity that you need, they're just the most important anti-cancer foods, but they're also a diet of only those foods which would make you deficient in B12 and possibly even um, zinc. You wouldn't necessarily have enough DHA for brain, for brain shrinkage and maximal cognitive function in later life. We've um, investigated this and I, my life has been, my 30 years of medical practice taking care of a vegan community over the years 
of elderly people showed an inordinate amount of people with DHA deficiency, mm -hmm. leading to brain shrinkage, cognitive impairment, dementia, and increased risk of Parkinson's disease because when you're defi so deficient in DHA in some people, because we convert EPA, we convert the ALA from flax seeds and walnuts and green vegetables into first EPA and then DHA, and those conversion enzymes are those of function or different in different people. It's genetically correct. Um, yeah. separate. So some people might convert a lot and some people might not convert um, very well. And there was a study done on 160 people, which was funded by the Nutrition Research Foundation, found that about 60% of vegans had a, um, an omega-3 index below four. And some of them, like 20%, had below three. Mm -hmm. And that would really put them in a negative um, risk of brain shrinkage. I'm very cautious to make sure that people optimize their DHA level and try to keep their levels above five, which in most cases requires supplementation. Some mm -hmm. people can do it naturally, but most cases require supplementation. And, and you know, I don't think a vegan diet um, gives the elderly or gives people passing middle age into their elderly years, um, zinc adequacy, zinc optimizing zinc intake. Zinc is a tremendous factor in poor improving immune function and beneficial effects on longevity, increasing and also been shown to decrease risk of pneumonia in the, and death of pneumonia and infection in the elderly. And so mm -hmm. supplementing with zinc is, is beneficial as well as B12 and making sure your vitamin D status is normal and probably, you know, so, so I'm saying neither are G-bombs sufficient as the food. We also eat other foods than that too. You know, because obviously you're not just eating greens and beans, you're all, but, but in any case, um, we might be eating squash and carrots and parsnips and rutabaga and, and tomatoes and all kinds of other foods that are important for your health. Um, but because we're going after more nutritional variety than GMOs, we're also, we're supplementing conservatively, intelligently based on research and findings and experience of knowing what are the defects of moving your, moving your diet so plant-based, there's certain nutrients you're missing that may be, make your diet suboptimal on those nutrients. Because through the generations of human survival on the planet, we were not surviving for, for hundreds of generations on vegan diets. Our diet is still, our body is still dependent for most of us on DHA, B12, and some other nutrients that may be optimally supplied better by animal products. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's just touch on that. I've got a follow on, a bunch of follow on questions, but let's just touch on that. Uh, so there's this. Um, I guess debates or the diets that we know in today's world get so religious anymore uh, in terms of what you should be eating, if animal protein is good or bad. And you right. referenced some studies, I believe there's one that showed if you take more than 20% animal protein in your diet, it increases your odds of all cause mortality, the rate of all cause mortality. Um, so there's some studies that don't portray uh, a lot of animal protein in a positive light. Um, right. There's other proponents of animal protein that say that if you eat the protein that was found in nature, for example, grass-fed beef or pasture-raised chicken, then it's much more healthier. It has a higher quality of omega-3 omega fatty acids in it, and it's, it's not going to cause you the challenges, the problems that uh, pr processed uh, animal feed or feedlot meat might do. So there's one. Two, you touched on uh, EPA and DHA. We need to supplement that because we might not have the conversion enzymes to go from ALA to DHA. So right. there might be a fish oil supplement or other ways to supplement a vegan DHA possibly. So what are your thoughts, I guess, Dr. Furman, on animal foods, animal protein, but also uh, the nutritive parts of animal foods like liver or kidneys or brain? Well, first of all, I have to say that um, the idea that grass fed or naturally raised animal products are more disease protective than ones that are commercially raised, that's a hypothesis because that's not what the literature shows. Mm -hmm. Even though theoretically it sounds right, and I'm sure it's true, I'm not denying it, but there's no studies to document that. The studies show that was, we have a, a lot of studies on Australian pasture-raised meats, and as people eat more animal products from pasture-raised natural animal products, they have shorter lifespans and they have high rates of cancer and heart disease. So all the studies testing that showed higher rates of death with, with natural raised animal products. Not, not, they didn't. So as you go to higher levels of animal product consumption, and we start to see the increased level of death after 10% of calories from animal products, we start to see death. Even in the Seventh-day Adventist study, even at, at, even at range close to 10, lower, maybe even 7 or 8%, more than one serving a week actually showed increased risk of heart attack deaths as people gained from more than one serving a week to two servings a week. You know what I mean? So we're, so we're talking about, um, and no, no degree of protection from that moving to natural animal products. That's just a theory. There's no studies that document that. It's because it's, it's not the pesticides or the omega-3 in the animal products. It's the amount of animal protein that animal protein is growth promoting, the body gets excess protein, it produces more IGF-1. But that doesn't mean that some people don't need animal products. 
and maybe even more than one serving a week, maybe three servings a week in small amounts. Because some people, as they age, their ability to digest and assimilate protein goes down, and maybe their plant protein diet has their IGF-1 dropping too low, going back to hormonal favorability again. Mm -hmm. And with your IGF-1 getting too low, you can have suppressed immunity, increasing risk of cancer. I see. So for different individuals, for most individuals, you can be on a vegan diet and plant protein supplies you with that best range of IGF-1. But for some people, they still can't, they can supplement the plant diet with pea protein and hemp protein and, and um, you know, and soybeans and things and get and see if they can get that up. But a lot of, but sometimes they just do better adding some animal products for it to slow to, for increased digestibility mm -hmm. and increased assimilation of proteins, especially if they're getting frail, muscular weakness or bone loss with aging, and they're getting not functioning as well physically, intellectually, or the blood tests show their IGF-1 is too low. So we have to really not fixate on one religious um, idea and be able to modify things somewhat for individuals that are different, number one. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the other point was, you know, how much, I think how much animal products is safe for most people I think it's in the range of zero to 7% or 5% because most disease reversal studies like Ornish or, st or populations that don't have heart disease are, are in the blue zones with less than 10%. And we see disease reversal occur in the 5% range. So I think that in the, in the 15 to 30% range, because Americans are above 30%, in the 15 to 30% range, you probably see genetics play more of a role. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Once you're above 30%, everybody gets diseases anyway. And once you get below 15%, then genetics play more of a role. Some people are good and some people are not. So I think that, yeah, so it's a difficult question to answer. Do you yeah, yeah. follow up or did I answer that adequately? Yeah, yeah, no, you did. Now, let me uh, touch, that, touch on that in a different way in terms of uh, EPA, DHA, we talked about that. When it comes to eating fish or fish consumption, and I'll, I will, I've read The Blue Zones uh, by Dan Buettner, and I've been to one of the blue zones in uh, Okinawa, Japan, and I've seen it firsthand. What uh, they're not even people... doing it anymore there. <laughs> Hardly. You have it's to... like all the people aren't even eating that healthy there anymore. Yeah, when you go to Okinawa, you are shocked because it's a concrete jungle and there's McDonald's everywhere. Yeah, so I was... it's not like it used to be. Yeah, know? I was taken aback. I was like, this is definitely not the place. I made a mistake. Oh, I need to a... leave. It's not a blue zone anymore. It's just it's... a historical blue zone, like right. Know? And then I I met some people that said, oh, there's this village of longevity which is two hours driving distance from Okinawa. So yeah. they took me there, thankfully. And then I finally saw up on a village in the, in the mountain, it's all yeah. green, there's no stores, and they all had their gardens in the backyard and they were living a long life. So yeah. it's, it's very interesting. It was shocking to go to Okinawa and see what's happening. Right. Um, but I guess the point that you're making is they, across the blue zones, they eat very little, very little animal meat. It was just because animals are hard to kill. They weren't available as these societies were, were living their life. And so they weren't eating that much um, until they started maybe raising animals. Right. Um, but regardless, they didn't eat much animals, hardly. Uh, secondly, I guess when we talk about fish, is, in your opinion, is fish a good source of food um, or fish oil? And how often or how should people supplement with fish, if at all? And, and by the way, I just want, think I'd make it clear is that I'm not, I'm suggesting that the blue zones are not the healthiest way to eat. Because they're just eating diets that are culturally and socially and, and indigenous foods to their areas, right. but they're not scientifically designed to be ideal. Correct. That a nutritarian diet takes the best aspect of every blue zone, mm -hmm. looks at what foods are contributing the most to longevity, and isolates and tests, sees if those foods have been tested adequately in the scientific literature, see if they really protect cancer, and then putting a diet together, a dietary portfolio that blows the blue zones out of the water. And now that's why we can see lifespan enhancing to, you know, to let's say 95 to 105, whereas most blue zones only on the average average only got five to 10 years of increased longevity over the average American, not, not 20 years of increased longevity, which I'm claiming is possible mm -hmm. to even to make the diet even more excellent. And it can make it taste great too, because the blue zones don't have, don't have access to all the foods that we have access to that we can eat like wild blueberries and, and baby bok choy and things like that. You know? mm -hmm. Okay. So the question is about the EPA and DHA. Yeah. Um, yes. I, I, obviously a lot of people that follow my work and a lot of people that want to be, don't want to use animal products. And mm -hmm. so we make a, an, uh, so I have manuf I have had made a DHA, a vegan EPA DHA made by the Monopoly, the same company that makes all the vegan DHA in the country. But the difference between the way I had it, I wanted to have it made and shipped to me because I have it put in glass and kept in refrigerated trucks on the way to my warehouse. And then we keep it under refrigeration when it arrives. Because of my experience in my practice was that 
people who are requiring it and taking it would often get indigestion and burping and a foul taste in their mouth. Or, and I said, so how could this be good if it's causing indigestion? So I went and had it tested and it would have high rancidity scores, a high TBA score. Mm -hmm. So I said to the company, I'm people getting these things that are not fresh. How can I make it fresh? And they said, well, you sits in a health food store for a year. It's not under refrigeration. The only thing we could do is pack it in glass and send it to your refrigerator. So I said, okay, do that. I'll send it to me. I'll keep it on refrigeration. So I, um, but in any case, I started that with my own, for my own family and my own patients, you know what I mean, um, to, ha to do it that way. So yes, you can get vegan DHA. And if you're buying commercially in a store, read the label where, where the expiration date was and the manufacturing date. So you're trying to get the product as fresh as you can. Same with fish oil. Freshness matters because oils can, turn, can go bad over time. You can't just keep it out of the refrigerator for two or three years and expect it not to be. And also the people swallow pills. It means they don't taste it. So it doesn't, so if, it, if you cut the pill open, the fish oil pill and crush it in your mouth, you wanna make sure that you, the oil you're taking doesn't have any off taste. It doesn't taste rancid. It should have mm -hmm. the, no, not much taste at all if it's fresh, you know yeah. what I mean? Okay, yeah. and so okay. that, right, it could be a little bit of fish or a little bit of fish oil or a little bit of vegan um, DHA. Those are your options. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm suggesting that I've shied more away from fish as the years progressed is because of the plastic dumping in the ocean and that there's so much microplastic particles, even in small fish, where I used to probably think sardines and were, were, a, good, were a good source of, to add to your diet or even um, oysters or something like that as small fishes were better because the larger fishes have more mercury and more pollution in them. But now we're finding high levels of microplastic even in the smaller fishes. So I don't recommend people use fish that much as a source of EPA or DHA. And if you get too much, you're getting too much animal protein. But even if you use it in smaller amounts a few times a week, I still think it's probably better not to go over fish more than once a week and use the and use an, a, even a purified fish oil or a, or a vegan DHA to not to chance getting more of those pollutants into your body. So I'm concerned about that. We don't know the effects of the plant microplastics in human tissues. Now we have a, a credit card amount of plastic in almost all humans in this country and people are eating plastic all the time. They're eating drinking water in plastic yeah. and they're eating food out of plastic and they're eating food, fish that have plastic in the fish and they're doing all, you know, so we have, so I'm just trying to be a little more, a little more cautious. Yeah, completely understood. And I know we're coming up on time, but I have two or three very important questions for you that I want to touch on while we have you on the show. Um, so let's touch on beans, Dr. Furman. Um, the, what I love about beans is that the glycemic index and the glycemic load are very low. And I'm a big fan of that. Uh, there's many studies that prove beans to be a healthy food. All of the blue zones eat them, so they're not killing them any sooner. We know that. Um, and, but certain folks, uh, including Dr. Gundry, talk about beans having digestive irritants and digestive enzyme inhibitors, such as lectins and phytates, which also happen to block the absorption of some minerals like zinc and iron and manganese, for example, um, and also irritate your gastrointestinal tract. So what's your perspective on beans and how much beans should we, eat, should we be eating? And is there a way to prepare them? So I'd love your guidance for the It's listeners. just not true. I mean, what he's, he, he's saying things that are false and not supporting the scientific literature. If you look at his book and those studies he posts, they don't, the studies don't support the claims he made. Nevertheless, it is true that undercooked beans have those harm, have, can have some harmful effects. And we know that people have been poisoned, injured, digestive tract irritation, all those things you're mentioning when people eat undercooked beans. Mm -hmm. So we don't recommend people eat beans undercooked. So I was at a, an Aspen ski vacation and they served us beans, black beans for breakfast to put in our oatmeal, which I wanted them to put black beans in the oatmeal in the morning to increase our protein on the ski slopes. And, but they were hard as a rock. They didn't cook them long enough. So they told her, don't eat the beans, they're not cooked well enough. You know, so absolutely, you should soak the beans all the night, overnight, mm -hmm. and you should cook them for at least an hour, sometimes even on a slow heat for an hour and a half, or put them in a stew or a super pressure cooker, and make sure the beans are soft. Once the beans are soft, there's no, you, you those lectins and those enzyme inhibitors are deactivated. And, right. and that's nothing new. People knew that for years. It's just a lot of people are ignoring it or have ignored it. But beans are a very safe food when cooked adequately. Um, and they don't um, have much function as as um, nutritional binders in that way. They're a wonderful food. And also when you cook a bean in a soup or a stew or a chili and you're overcooking it, it's water-based cooking. So you're not leaching the nutrients out of the bean and throwing it away. You're not leaching, losing it from overcooking it because you're cooking it in a water base. So any nutrients lost from the beans due to the cooking process, you're still eating in the fluid of the stew, the chili, the wok, you know, or the, or the soup you're making. 
So one of my um, recommendations is to have a big salad with a bowl of vegetable bean soup for lunch and even one piece of fruit. It gives you a well-balanced meal with protein and greens and of, you know, and low glycemic and onions and mushrooms and all these things and, um, and, and properly cooked beans are a superfood. Okay, and linked to lower rates of cancer across the board. Yeah, fantastic. I actually love eating beans and like lentils and I just soak them overnight to reduce some of the damaging effects of these gastro and, and uh, irritants, right. so to speak. Yeah. Soak uh, them okay. overnight, change the water, and then cook them and you have no problems. Fantastic. That's great advice. Okay, so let's move on to uh, nuts and seeds versus oils. We know that there's two types of oils, uh, omega-3 and omega-6. Omega-3, omega-6 come from um, safflower, sunflower, uh, canola, a lot of the vegetable seed oils uh, in their cooking oils, basically. Um, but there's omega-6 healthy, rich oils as well, such as walnuts and olive oil, for example. Is there, and I certainly eat uh, my share of uh, omega-3 oils, uh, fish oils, but also walnut and olive. Is there a difference in your mind between just sprinkling a ton of olive oil in your vegetable salad uh, versus eating walnuts or olives whole? Absolutely. I think it's a difference between getting cancer and not getting cancer. I can make the radical statement that olive oil causes breast cancer. How really? can I make that radical statement? It's so crazy. How can I believe anything I say if I say olive oil causes breast cancer? It's because people are fat and they have 20, 30, 50 pounds of extra body weight. And if they're pouring oil on their food all the time, they're never going to lose that weight. You know, the, it's fattening and fat causes cancer and oils are 120 calories a tablespoon. And unless you have a job working behind a plow and picking up heavy labor all day or a, phys or a professional athlete, you're not going to keep your body fat low enough to protect yourself against cancer. Body fat matters and oil contribute. When you take olive oil on your food, it's an appetite stimulant and it tells the body to store fat, which you're not breaking down fat when you're storing fat. You're either breaking down fat or you're storing fat. And if you're mm -hmm. storing fat, you're not losing weight. And if you're taking in, show me people who are taking in, you know, olive oil on their food and taking in 500 calories like the average American does, 500 calories of oil a day, and show me that person who has a low body fat. And I'll say, well, that's rare. That's, I haven't seen that in one in a hundred cases or something. You know what I mean? Unless they're really like a, a, a super athlete or a super active person. The bottom line is, I would say every nutritional scientist who studied this in the world would say, walnuts are healthier than walnut oil. Sesame seeds are healthier than sesame seed oil. A low salt natural olives are healthier than olive oil. Avocado is healthier than avocado oil. Flax seeds are healthier than flaxseed oil. In the seed, you have lignans, you have sterols, you have stanols, you have anti-cancer substances. And, the, and these fibers in the, in the seeds and nuts bind the fat and carry a section of it out into the toilet bowl. So when you eat your nuts and seeds for your fat source and make a salad dressing out of that, all the calories are not biologically available and they turn down the apostat more effectively, which oil does not. They reduce your appetite, which oil does not reduce the appetite. Give a person two tablespoons of olive oil in the, with the meal. They won't cut the rest of the other food they're eating down by 240 calories. They'll just add those 240 calories to the meal they're eating. You give them 200 calories of nuts, they'll eat 200 calories less of something else. And all 200 calories of nuts won't come in anyway, leading to moderate caloric restriction. Because be when you eat beans, all their calories aren't biologically accessible. They suppress your appetite by 200 calories. Your apostat and your hypothalamus are turned down by 200 calories, but then only 150 calories came in. The same thing in with the, with the nuts. When you eat oil, it's the opposite effect. It promotes overeating. It leads to more calories in the meal and it stops fat storage and it's fattening. So, um, so just because olive oil is fattening or just because a healthy oil, oil, because one oil is healthier than another, they're still all fattening. Mm, interesting. I've Thank you for sharing. I've never heard that perspective before. So uh, I'm going to look into this and read some more of your work uh, regarding just this aspect. Now, the last thing I want to touch on, Dr. Furman, I'd be remiss if I didn't do it, is talking about the high rates of diabetes in our society. And the, re the reason where a lot of our people are, a lot of people uh, in all countries are getting diabetes. And uh, I want to touch on the importance of high blood glucose, but also high insulin, which not a lot of people talk about. And so just very briefly for the, for the listeners, all the carbohydrates that you eat get converted into glucose that goes into your bloodstream. Uh, what you need right away gets absorbed by your muscles and liver, but the rest either gets converted to fat or it's actually attacking in your blood vessels. It's attacking the other fats. It's attacking your DNA. It's attacking your proteins and preventing them from doing any more work. So sugar in your bloodstream does no good to anybody. Uh, so Right. The, it turned, that's right. What you're saying right now, the scientific term for that 
it causes a buildup of advanced glycation end products, yes. right. which glycate and damage tissue throughout your whole body when you have mm -hmm. chronic exposure to spikes of glucose in your bloodstream. It's the combination between heightened insulin with heightened glucose that causes con um, consecutive damage to the body and ages us prematurely. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, and the fact that um, Americans are eating so much processed foods and they're addicted to sugar and, and, and other sweeteners. And I'm saying something further that white flour and these processed grains work on the body the same as sugar. So when you look at that piece of white bread or pizza, it, just look at it as a sugar cube. There's not a biologically difference between a sugar cube. And you can't eat that stuff and not pay a price with health, with health problems down the road. Right. And, and this, this sugar, uh, or basically what happens to a grain that's found in nature with the husk and everything, we take that and we break it down completely, process it so that it's all of that's lost. So it's very, very fine. And it goes through the digestive tract very, very quickly. So it's absorbed. Um, now, I, I want to ask, I guess, a follow on to by that. The, by the way, I'm agreeing with you. And I'm also adding to that and saying mm -hmm. even, even whole wheat flour is sometimes they're making products made with whole wheat pastry flour that's yeah. ground so finely yeah. that it's even glycemically excessive, even though it's the whole grain. You know, that's why the only breads I eat are like the sprouted grains that aren't co that are coarsely ground, like yeah. the Ezekiel bread, the Ezekiel food for life or the food or the or the manna bread that are made with just sprouted grains that are much more um, lower glycemic, like a seeded bread or something. You know, mm -hmm. my my dad is diabetic and he loves eating whole wheat flour, finely ground every day because they love eating bread and he eats pita bread. And so this time when I went to see him, we, we talked about it. We read books together and he's finally converted. He still needs the bread. So we converted to chickpea, coarsely grained chickpea bread. Yeah, which, yeah, which the glycemic index of whole wheat is about 70 and of chickpea is about 27. So I'm like, you're winning, even though you're eating bread and I don't love it. It's and processed. Yeah. Right. But and you could make, you know, we make all kinds of dishes from lentils and chickpeas and soybean and, and cauliflower and we cauliflower, you know, um, you know, what are they called? Cauliflower wraps, cauliflower like pitas and things. We have all kinds yeah. of things. You can make a lot of things you can do. But you, mm -hmm. but of course, um, beans are your most favorite carbohydrate because of their low glycemic and the presence of resistant starch. But also when you're off the saturated fats, saturated fats distort the shape of insulin receptors and make you more insulin resistant. That's all these paleo people. They say, oh, I, I got it. I can't, I can't eat any carbohydrate at all because even if I have an oatmeal or steel cut oats or anything like that, my sugar goes up through the roof. Yeah, your sugar goes up through the roof because you've damaged your insulin receptors mm. because all the animal products you're eating and all the animal fats, even though they don't spike your glucose, they damage your insulin receptors. And now when you do have something with a carbohydrate in it, your response becomes more dangerous. So, so there's a lot of um, um, confusion in this arena. Mm -hmm. Okay, absolutely last question here. So- in the, in the decades before you get diabetes, when you're, you know, uh, when a doctor says you've officially gotten diabetes now uh, or diagnosed with it, there's a high insulin for years, maybe even a decade, uh, that's causing all the extra sugar that you're taking in to be shoved into your cells. What is the problem with having high insulin in our bodies? And why is that so dangerous? Or is it? Well, uh, remember, we, yes, it absolutely. That's right. The beta cells in the pancreas. Let's say me, I weigh 145 pounds and my body fat's around 10%. Maybe I need 10 units of insulin a day, maybe eight units of insulin a day produced by my beta cells. If I gain 20 pounds and I weigh 160 pounds or 165, my beta cells need to produce 20 units of insulin a day, not 10, double the amount. If I gain 50 pounds, it might be produce eight times the amount of insulin. I may have to produce 80 units of insulin a day if I was 50 pounds overweight because the fats on the body blocks the ability of insulin to be uptake in the cells. Now, insulin is a growth promoting hormone. It makes you get fat, but it promotes angiogenesis. Mm -hmm. Angiogenesis allows cancer cells to replicate. It's, it promotes cellular replication, which means it's allowing cancers and abnormal cells to glean a blood supply and replicate and metastasize. So not only does the heightened level of insulin, and what we're both saying right now is that this level of insulin is high in all overweight people and all people eating American type, type diets, even though they don't have diabetes because the body can produce an extra amount of insulin, keeping their body glucose in the favorable range, but the high insulin itself is premature aging them and causing, allowing cancer cells to replicate. 
And over the years, the beta cells may poop out and no longer be able to secrete 80 units of insulin a day. Maybe they can only secrete 50 units of insulin a day. But a healthy person only needed 10. But the 50 units of insulin a day isn't enough for the person who's 50 pounds overweight. So their glucose starts to rise and they become diabetic and they have high glucose and high insulin, which causes more acceleration of the aging process and more destruction of brain cells. Yeah, that's, we should avoid that as much as possible. So definitely check out Dr. Furman's you have to lose. You have to lose weight. And I'm telling people, you're not following a nutritarian diet if you're overweight, unless you're losing at least two pounds a week. If you do this right, people are losing three to four pounds a week the first month, and then they settle down to two or three pounds a week. But if you're not losing two pounds a week doing this, you're not on the right diet. Ah, fantastic. That's okay. a pound every three days. Get it yeah. off and get healthy. Yeah. So Dr. Froman, you run retreats, you run events, you host online programs to help and educate people lose the weight, but also live much happier and healthier lives. Please tell our listeners how they can find what you do and how they can work with you. Well, it's so easy just to go to the website, to go to drfurman.com. People can communicate with me in the member center there and the Ask the Doctor forum, but there's tons of free information, you know, recipes and articles and things they can read. They can buy one of my books. They can even buy it on Amazon, like Eat for Life. And for people who are, um, have significant serious conditions and want to come to my retreat and stay here for a couple, for a month or so, or a month or two or three or longer. Like I had a woman here who just left who lost she was here. She lost 80 pounds when she was here for wow. three and a half months. And she went home and lost another 70 pounds since she's been home now. She dropped 150 pounds this year Fantastic. Um, for, because we taught her the skills she needed to continue to do this on her own when she left. I mean, mm -hmm. people go away to these places for a week or two and they don't have the skills and they gain the weight back again. So, right. when we, so, so I have a place for people who have medical issues and who just want to come and get healthier. Can, but we don't take people for a weekend or a week. We only take people who stay a month or longer per month because we want to really impact the little, the small place we have in the limited rooms. We want to take making sure we're impacting long-term in their life. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I have a facility in San Diego. It's a beautiful place. And we're, and I love doing this because I love to be part of people's health transformations. So the website, and they can look on the website for seeing, they could see the retreat or, and they can see the, and, you know, and they can get more information if they're interested in that too. Yeah, absolutely. So folks, if you're listening, check out Dr. Furman's website, go check out all the programs he does, but the retreat that he's talking about is uh, the most life-changing thing that he does. So yeah, it's drfurman.com is D-R-F-U-H-R-M-A-N.com. Okay. Fantastic. Dr. Furman, thank you so much for coming on the Anti-Aging Hacks show. It was a lot of fun. Good luck to everybody. Best of health.